Good afternoon, everyone. We are delighted to welcome you to the BOV webinar on creating real value out of operational risk management. We are excited to see some familiar names and also very pleased to welcome new uh, participants. We know that the audience today is very diverse. We have very experienced risk practitioners with us today, as well as uni university students from various universities in Malta. So we welcome you all. A few logistical points before we start. This is a webinar, so you will be muted throughout the session. There will be plenty of opportunities to interact with us, and we welcome this interaction. There will be live polls. Please join in. They are anonymous, and you will see their results. Um, there will be also opportunity for Q&A. Please use the chat button and send us the questions. Send us the questions. Send us your views and opinions throughout the presentation, as well as in the end. We will leave some time for the Q&A. So let me start by introducing ourselves. I am Elena Pikova. In BOV, I am the executive head of operational risk management. Operational risk management combines three units, operational risk business partnering, IT and cyber risk, as well as a, a topical area of operational resilience and third party risk management. So I integrate and lead these three units. About myself, I feel very passionate about the operational risk discipline. As you can see, I've got some many years experience um, in various organizations. Apart from my day-to-day -day job, I like to give operational risk a voice. And so I've been a former director of education at the Institute of Operational Risk. I run um, public and in-house training sessions at various um, organizations, as you can see below, the London Stock Exchange Academy, Euronext, Cambridge University, and others. I'm also, I've been privileged to put my thoughts into a book of operational risk management in financial services. And I feel that this is probably the best and the most exciting area to build your career in. And I hope this passion will translate to yourselves throughout this webinar. And now let me introduce my colleague, Antoine. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as the slide says, my name is Antoine Colina. I've been with Bank of Latin now for about six years, um, in mainly in the role as an information security officer. I have a number of years experience within IT and specifically IT risk information security. Um, I'm a techie at heart. I have uh, my background from here, University of Malta, Bachelor of Science, and then I kind of continued my studies uh, or my interests within artificial intelligence abroad. Um, but I've always found myself working within the financial area. And um, today we're going to be talking to you, yes, about operational risk, yes, about cyber, and yes, about cyber awareness. So um, hang on, it's not going to be that long. We've just got an hour webinar, and um, we'll uh, enjoy the process together. Thank you, Antoine. And let's... Sorry, we'll... Yes, we, we, Antoine will have to be. Yes, thank you. So we picked some topics today uh, for our discussion. So we basically picked three topics because it's only an hour session as Antoine has managed. And we'll talk about risk culture and role of risk management in sending the right messages and risk conversations. We'll then talk about one very specific operational risk tool, which is a core tool of the framework, risk and control self-assessments. And then we'll dedicate some time to, to the cyber deep dive. So let's start with the role of risk, risk department in building and embedding the culture, the risk culture of the organization. I think if we refer to the regulatory documents, and you can see an example of two of them to the right-hand side, um, one being the three lines um, framework from the Institute of Internal Auditors. This is the recent document. As we all know, as practitioners, it, it has always been three lines of defense. 
Now the word defense has been removed and we are the three lines working more collaboratively together, as well as some corporate governance frameworks. The words we pick that almost demonstrate what the risk department is doing is developing and implementing frameworks, identifying and assessing risks, individual, aggregate, emerging, establishing early warning or trigger systems, reporting, influencing, so some strong words, influencing, as well as providing expertise, support, monitoring, and challenge. And this is um, such a good, I think, model of risk being a knowledgeable expert that is influencing, providing support, providing challenge. So, so this type of an image really needs to translate into our day-to-day -day practices. In reality, if we look at what our risk practitioners are doing on a daily basis, and I like to think about it as risk conversations, and I'll talk today about enhancing risk conversations, because the way I like to um, think about it is requesting risk practitioners, whether in the first or the second line, to step back and listen to the words and listen to their own conversations. What words come to mind when we pick up the phone, when we switch on the webcam? And you can see on the left-hand side, sort of the red zone of how I see it, is a very much um, administrative zone where risk is chasing, let's use this word, the business for some type of completion of the form. So it becomes an exercise of filling a particular form. Have you done this? Have you filled the form? Have you logged an incident? You've got open options. You, you need to do something. So it's sort of a risk department coming across as administrative. And that type of conversation, that type of dialogue sends the ripples through the organization and creates the image that risk management is full of administration and for form feeling. On the contrary, what we really want to talk about and how we want to embody those regulatory documents that gave us all these big words like influencing, being an advisor and challenging is the content-based deeper conversations which are focused on Let's discuss how the control environment can be improved. Is there a budget to fix the high risk issue? How is this change on new product impacting your risk profile? So these are very much risk management conversations. What is the cost of control? Sometimes we forget this one, which is on the bottom. Should we accept the risk as mitigation is not cost effective? And that's quite interesting. As risk managers, we usually tend to focus on putting more controls, identifying weaknesses, threats, and requesting the business to identify and, and fix the issues and put more controls in. So actually, risk acceptance is also a very powerful tool. So this right-hand side, again, will send the positive ripples throughout the organization and will teach the business and teach the other employees on how does good risk management look like. This can um, only work if we've got the right structure in place. And one of the things that I feel strongly about is the um, correct structure, which has the experts in the second line, risk department, who are really supported by risk correspondents, sometimes called one and a half lines of defense. So these are these are our crown jewels. These are the champions of risk management. They are, they've got the best of both worlds. They um, know the business. They are also trained on risk management. So they wear two hats and they facilitate the implementation and the embedding of the risk culture and risk management within the, within, within the business areas of the organization. And really, um, this is such a powerful structure uh, that without it, it makes it much more difficult when risk experts are only represented by a very slim group, very um, 
in a few staff experts in the second line of defense. So, so this risk correspondence um, multiply the power of risk management and play a crucial role in how the organization is um, embedding the risk culture. I think the risk correspondence also can only be effective if they are not the only ones so that that um, relay this power of risk management that it's not just them who are the fixers let's call them so-called fixers that they have to identify the risks and fix them and everyone else abdicates their responsibility saying that of course we manage operational risk we've got that person in the corner they are doing all the risk management activities so that's the right that's the wrong approach and risk correspondence or risk champions have to be supported by the whole risk thinking or what we like to um, think about is i am risk thinking within the organization and this i am risk thinking puts the accountability and the responsibility on managing risk to each and every individual so that i am responsible to identify assess manage and report on risk not compliance, not my colleagues in risk, but I am responsible for that. And what we would like to do now is to play a video clip, which will take two minutes. And that is something we have developed, which we believe supports, um, supports this message. So hopefully technology works. Let's play the video clip. At BOV, we are exposed to operational risk, which arises due to inadequate controls or poorly built processes, employee errors, system failures, or even external events like the COVID-19 pandemic. When operational risk materializes, for example, in erroneous payment to a client or cash difference at the till, system downtime preventing customers from accessing our services, or even a fraudulent transaction, this can impact our clients, causing them harm, leading to financial losses to the bank, or have regulatory and reputational consequences. BOV has operational risk management procedures in place to help employees identify, assess, manage, and report on significant operational risks, whether related to operations, information technology, human resources, tangible assets, financial crime, conduct, or regulation. But who is responsible for raising and managing these risks? You are. We all are. Every one of us, whether at the senior or junior level, has a duty to identify, assess, manage, and report on significant operational risks. We need to apply I am risk thinking, a mentality that I am responsible for raising a hand when things go wrong and reporting them promptly. How? When you notice that things can go wrong, report them to your manager in the first instance and log a risk event report. Who to reach out to? What if you are not sure? There are people out there to support you. Risk correspondents are appointed employees within every area who can help. Reach out and discuss a potential risk event with your risk correspondent. You can also reach out to the risk department if in doubt. Send an email to the Ask Risk mailbox and experts from the risk department will read and respond to your message. Why? We all agree that we want to make BOV a sustainable and better workplace. Not raising a risk event may actually result in negative impacts to the bank, our customers, and our people. The bank aims to manage and address operational risks and is therefore committed to help and support you. Apply I am risk thinking and let us all take responsibility today. You are responsible to identify, assess, manage, and report on risks. We all are. At BOV, we... 
So I hope you enjoyed the clip. We, we do like it. And um, I think it's a combination of um, formal structures, risk committees, as well as informal almost video clips and more playful tools that in combination relay the message to our people. I wanted also to touch upon the brand and the importance of thinking about the brand of risk. And you can see here, risk management, we've developed our um, brand and the wording with it, which is collaborating to safeguard sustainability. What is risk, essentially? Risk, if we look at the standards like ISO or COSO, is always in relation to strategy. So it's thinking about risk to strategic objectives. Risk is a true partner to help identify and mitigate risks that may prevent us from achieving our strategy. So there is um, sustainability here, which is protection of profits. There is also a very um, collaborative partnering attitude in the word collaboration. So I think it's important to think of the brand that risk is not a policeman. And I think how it, um, the department and how all the employees present themselves and what type of dialogues they have, have to come from um, you know, thinking consciously about this, this brand um, reputation and prestige. And then one more slide before we do a live poll, because we would like to hear your point of view as well. I will touch upon the organizational risk culture, which is a social process. And it touches upon risk awareness, risk taking and risk management. And operational risk is very closely linked and largely depend, dependent on the risk culture of the organization. So I like to think about key aspects of the organizational risk culture, which you can see on the right hand side which includes things like no blame you know what is the first question which is asked by senior executives when an employee raises an incident you know is that who has done that which would very much result in a blame culture or let's have a look what is the issue and how can we resolve it sort of the constructive approach which very much then leads to um, encouraging people to report on um, events and conduct lessons learned. I think we wouldn't go far without personal accountability. The um, attitude where employees at all levels feel comfortable and confident to say, and I will fix it, and I will volunteer to take this forward, as well as risk awareness and risk reward. And if we move on to the next slide, you will see that we will try a poll. So I will now launch a poll, which you would hopefully be able to see. And the poll is um, asking for your view on how do you believe risk management is seen? And there is a choice there. And, and the poll is anonymous. So uh, there is at the end, hopefully you are able to vote and see the poll. And at the end, I will share the results because it would be very interesting to see a quick snapshot from this room. Um, and the perception is, is quite an interesting topic, which has been discussed by many individuals and you know, by many think tanks, consultancy companies, regulators of what is the brand and the reputation of risk. And I think it applies to all areas and geographies where we are in Malta, in, in the UK, in the US. So in each and every organization in all geographies, I think it is a very pertinent question to ask ourselves. So let me... I can see many of you have voted. Let me end the poll and share the results. So quite an interesting picture because in today's audience, we've got, I would say, split opinions. And it's quite interesting to me that many of you think, in fact, 52%, that risk is seen as sort of another department or another task to do. And really where we want to be is within this 25% of very well as a partner and a true collaborator. Unfortunately, there is a bit of a policeman. So you can see 18% of you think negatively as a police. And how can we today on the call risk practitioners, maybe aspiring risk specialists change this? How can we change together this brand and reputation?
So we will then move on um, to the next topic and touch upon risk assessments. Risk assessments is the core tool of the operational risk framework. In fact, this is the tool on which we spend probably the most of our time and the most of the time of our employees. And it is the tool that helps us to understand what are the risks of the present and near future, what keeps us up at night within the next year or five year time horizon. And as we know, you know, the past is presented by actual incidents or materialized risks and the, the more extreme but plausible sort of events are tackled by the scenario analysis process. And then from the risk assessments point of view, if we think about how they are um, structured and how they add value, really they should be linked to the business or strategic objectives. So it's what are the risks, what keeps us up at night in relation to the strategy. And then we identify inherent risks, key controls, and then the residual risks. And why do we do this? I think that's a very important question. We do this to outline the areas where controls are ineffective or inefficient and take action. And two things I'll draw up there. Firstly, the link to strategic objectives, which sometimes is forgotten. And the risk department almost goes a long way collecting its own list of risks and controls without the link to the strategy, as well as the final part, which is the so what question, taking action. So it's not just form feeling exercise, identifying, assessing risks. The most important part is the so what. And from this, I think if we look at the ways to present and visualize for senior management the output of the risk assessments to make the tool more actionable. And I think those of you who are experienced risk practitioners most probably are very familiar with so-called heat maps. I think if you are studying risk management and joining us as students, I think you would appreciate the visual tool that can reflect risk being two-dimensional on the impact and likelihood scale, reflecting the top risks, as well as immaterial risks, which are colored as green. And I know that the heat maps have been criticized by being judgmental. At the same time, I personally stand behind them. I feel that they are a very visual tool. Despite their judgmental nature, they help prioritize and focus on the most significant risks that keep us up at night. And that's for me the key use test, I would say, use test as in answering the so what question and making it actionable. And if we look at some of the industry benchmarks, and you can see here one of the industry sources, which many of you may be using already, I, there are plenty of industry sources. I like this one in particular, which is the World Economic Forum, the Global Risk Report, which comes out every year. So the World Economic Forum every year issues its risk profile. What are the top risks at a macro level that keep the world up at night? And I think a few points I'll draw out here. Firstly, you will see that the World Economic Forum also uses the impact and the likelihood. So effectively, it's the same tool and the same concept of having a heat map and drawing the attention to the upper right corner where the most significant risks are displayed. And the second point is the prevalence of operational risks on this map. So there are some financial risks, but from the operational risk perspective, um, and I know the slide may be a little bit small, so I've enlarged them on the left-hand side. You can see from the operational risk point of view, all the usual suspects of climate action failure, infectious diseases, cyber, weather, as well as IT infrastructure breakdown, these are all the types of risks that we identify and deal with together with the business. They are also highlighted 
by the World Economic Forum. And this is a fantastic benchmark amongst the other benchmarks that exist, that exist in the industry. And from this um, point of view, if we think about our tool, so risk management tool, risk and control self-assessments, based on the industry benchmarks, the tool attracts quite a lot of criticism. So the skeptics question whether it brings any value. Is that a form-filling exercise? And the critics openly state that that is a form-filling and that is a waste of time. And that, um, I would say, RCSA is um, my, probably the, the most favorite tool is the RCSA. And despite this industry feedback of, um, for example, you can see from ORX, which is the large um, loss data consortium that did this industry survey stating that RCSA is not sufficiently influenced business decisions. I think we have to internalize this feedback and reflect on the effectiveness and on the value of RCSAs within our own organization, because the topic of today is creating real value out of operational risk management. So having RCSA as a core tool and making it work, creating a vehicle that really brings value is very important. One of the thoughts that, and um, beliefs that I have quite a strong beliefs is really it should be called RCFA, which is RCSA has this self, self-assessment in its name. And I truly believe that it needs to be facilitated by an expert risk practitioner. And in fact, I did a live call with, with the industry and it transpired, you can see the, the results of the live call, and it transpired that in those organizations where risk department spend a significant time with the business explaining, facilitating, and leading these impactful risk conversations, the risk and control self-assessments brought a lot more value and answered a lot more this so what question. And finally, on the next slide, I will talk a little bit about the measures of success to the topic of today's event of creating real value out of operational risk management. I would pick three most tangible ways how the success can be measured. One is actionability, which is the number of actions and even more specifically and strongly, the monetary value of investments and control improvements as a result of the RCSA, which is we've done the exercise to understand our risk profile what investments, how have the board and senior management took, took it into consideration when putting money on the table and when making investments into the areas where controls are ineffective or inefficient. So that is one strong measure of success. The second one is a forward-looking risk profile, I would say, which is having a good fit-for-purpose picture of what keeps us up at night so that when internal audit or external audit comes in, in a way, we don't have any surprises. We can present our conducted risk assessment um, and say we actually know that we are not perfect. We've identified the areas and we are already dealing with them. So that to me is also a very strong measure of success because we, the last thing we want is for some unexpected unknown risks to be presented and identified by internal or internal auditors. And another simple way is gauging the stakeholder perception through some simple surveys to ask about the value or the perceived value of the exercise. So that is also important and useful for doing, especially in those organizations or in those instances where our CSA is, as an exercise is done for the first time. So let's do another poll on the proactive risk thinking. And this poll, let me launch it, asks you 
whether you believe employees think about risk proactively. So to what extent within your organizations, um, and I think if you are um, being a student and dialing in, just consider whether in general within of what you see, the practices that, that you've seen, you know, whether it's, yes, most employees consider risk in their daily job, whether it's just some, maybe these are just risk department employees, or maybe you are not sure at this stage. And again, as the first poll, it would be quite interesting to see a quick snapshot within this audience to look at the different practices. Okay, let me end the poll and share the results with you. Interesting, the, the first, the, where we want to be is yes, most employees consider risk in their daily job. And we are only 7% um, there. So 7% of you are feeling that we are pretty much there. And I think that demonstrates that as a community, as a strong community of risk experts, risk practitioners, we need to con continue working with our business to very actively explain, engage, use the right tools so that we move this, um, so that we move the dial and so that next time we do the poll, um, you know, we would have all actively voted um, as yes, most employees consider risk in their daily job. So with this, I would suggest um, that we move on to do a little bit more of a deep dive into the cyberspace. Very interesting, very topical space, a technical space, a space that um, is mandatory now for all of us to understand. It's almost um, not acceptable that our senior management and our employees do not have the awareness of such an important topic as cyber. And I would leave it over to Antoine. So, so please also do send us some questions or opinions throughout the chat button. And we would leave um, a little bit of time in the end of our joint presentation to discuss with you uh, and answer your questions. You can. So now we're going to have um, a little bit of a talk about increasing employee awareness regarding the cyber risk. But before we start about cyber risk per se, we've all understood that uh, effectively information security risk is a subset or a subcomponent of operational risk. And everything that Elena has just said in this last half hour is very valid even for cyber risk. It's not just cyber is there for the geeks cyber is there for the it people it's just not like risk cyber is everybody's problem cyber is not just there for it cyber is not just there for the authorities to deal with cyber is in true like operation risk, everybody's issue it's got to be handled from the very top down to the very bottom otherwise we're always going to be vulnerable for the next big cyber attack now the key area in relation to information security risk is also known as the CIA triad. Basically, we're always looking at confidentiality, integrity and availability. Now, these three items are not new to us. We always, we inherently, we all know what these things are. We always want to keep things secret. We always want to keep things accurate and we always want information when we need it to be available for us to use. And it's these three items, these three areas which are always at risk, especially with cyber. It's not just about uh, the hacker out there and what the hacker is actually going to gain access to. It's about how can we create controls, create mitigations, so to, to prevent the next cyber attack. So we always have to, when we're thinking about information security risk, we're always looking at it from the perspective of confidentiality, integrity and availability. And it's something which runs with us on a daily basis. It's how we look and look at categorizing incidents, potential incidents, vulnerabilities, or how we then say, okay, this matter was not an information security risk. It has to be handled more by a business-led process or operational risk team. But as many things as we think cyber is only related to zero, related to zero and ones, it's not just that. Cyber risk, information security risk, it's all about the people. It's all about the processes and the technology. But first and foremost, it's about the people. 
I'd like to share with you a quote, um, which is not written by a cyber expert. It's written by a legislator, by somebody from the ECB. And the quote goes, cyber risk needs to be part of general risk management procedures, of general crisis management and general business continuity planning. After all, it's an operational risk. Now, he goes on to say a number of things, very valid things in this article, but the, meta, the key point here is this. We must keep in mind that cyber risk does not invariably arise from technology itself or from how we use it. It is people who leave doors unlocked and gates wide open for cyber criminals to sneak in. Now, I'd like to spend a moment or two here and raise your interest about what this actually means. It's not about the technology. It's about the people who use the technology. It's about how we use the technology. These are the real take home messages here because we all use uh, a browser, we all use email, we all um, use e-banking or other technologies today. But how do we actually use it? We all make mistakes, we're human. As a consequence of some human errors, there are cyber incidents, information security risk. It's not up to IT just to resolve the issue all the time or look ahead so that issues aren't resolved. It's about the whole organization to do so. Very much on the same lines as the RCSA, which Elena was mentioning earlier, that we have to facilitate with IT with the business on how technology is best used to protect the organization. Now, a bit more specific about how uh, BOV looks at doing this. We have governance. Nearly all organizations, and actually all banks, have to have a very robust governance model. These are going to be looking at risk subcommittees, addressing technology, addressing risks in general, because everything has to be aligned to the organization's risk appetite. Coordination is critical. We need to work hand in hand with IT. This is not just risk because risk management doesn't own the risk. It's the business which owns the risk. So when we're saying integrating risk and IT, this is not something for risk management or the second line. It's not something for IT in the first line. It's not for the third line, which is audit. This is integrating risk at all levels within the organization, understanding what the business needs are, understanding what the IT risks are, and then finding a solution which, find, which has the appropriate balance in accordance to the bank's risk appetite. So we're linking back here to the governance as well. We have the culture. Once again, I am risk thinking. It is not IT's problem. It is not risk's problem. It is all of our issues. Incidents need, if somebody is aware of a weakness or an incident, we need to raise it. We need to escalate it to the appropriate channels to deal with it, to mitigate, to make sure it doesn't happen again. It's all about the risk culture of protecting our organization. We have to, we mentioned incidents. We have to analyze which incidents are there, which are happening time and time again. What do we have to pay more attention to? Which incidents need to be escalated to higher management, to regulators? Which incidents can we deal with within a short time frame or with a long time frame? Do we need to bring in a disaster recovery into the situation, business continuity? This is all then part of managing the crisis. And yes, every organization at one point or other, it is not a matter of if the organization will have a crisis, it's a matter of when. It's cyber, as you all know, is not um, going to go away. It's there to stay, we're all going to have to deal with it, and it's going to take a lot of effort to deal with and manage properly. And the organization can't do it if it's just one, one part of the organization. At risk, we have to look at ourselves and the organization and understand how to help the business, how to help IT to gain and how to deal with crises and cyber risk. And we do this primarily, not only through our CSAs, to, through coordination to all of the aspects of the slide, but key amongst which of these is the one in the lower right hand side, which is awareness. Now awareness most organizations have their e-learning, they do their phishing campaigns, but really and truly awareness needs to be taken to the next level. We, 
all organizations, we have BOV and all organizations, we're only as strong as the weakest part in the chain, the weakest link, if you may wish to call it, the weakest employee, the weakest department, because that is where the weaknesses will come from. And we need to maximize cyber awareness. Now, this is not just through an e-learning course. It is not just through phishing simulations and saying, oh, we just had 10% uh, or 5% of employees fell victim to a phishing attack. Well, that's not enough just to repeat and repeat and repeat. We have to take things to a slightly more elevated level. We know we want to improve security. We know employees do not want to create mistakes. They don't want to be the weakest link. They want to improve their awareness so that they kind of help protect the organization. And we want to help the organization grow as an organization in a very safe and productive manner. To do so, we have to look at humanistic events, humanistic layers, and the psychology behind it. Security awareness is the bare minimum. We need to do so to educate our staff, to show people what is right, what is wrong, how can we improve. We need to know what level of staff, what capabilities our staff actually have. That's a human risk measurement element. We need to understand what works, what doesn't work, how to actually reach out to our employees in a way which is meaningful and in a way which also translates into certain behaviors. So the behavior of raising awareness, the, uh, the, the behavior of notifying and raising of incidents, that is a positive behavior. The behavior of you're seeing an email, you don't recognize who the sender is, you're not aware of the product they are trying to sell you, and you don't click on the link. That is a positive behavior. You report it to information security or to another level or cybersecurity within your organization. That's another positive behavior. So those are the behaviors we want to reinforce within our organization. The phishing simulations are mere tests. We're just checking to see what level of cyber awareness um, employees are getting. And why am I picking on phishing simulations? Phishing simulations is just one of many different simulations or cyber awareness tools that we have at our disposal. I'm focusing here on phishing because email is the most prevalent means by which malware is actually being distributed across the internet. And lastly, but very not the least aspect, is the human intelligence. We're all about improving our intelligence quota within an organization. We want the smartest, we want the best, but it's not just about the best people, the best employees who are going to be the safest employees. It's about the employees who, through awareness training, through changes in their own behavior, reinforce security within an organization. Remember, the target, the target we want to reach is improved security model. We want to have an increased uh, employee awareness in security for self-efficacy. And we want to decrease costs of secure behavior. So we don't, we don't want to spend our hard-earned profits onto fixing issues. We want to spend our hard-earned profits into reinvestment within the organization to further develop the organization. One of the ways which this uh, translates, why, how awareness translates into potentially a real world or a real life uh, cyber incident is by looking at the different stages. There are six main areas of how we look at cyber incidents and how we deal with cyber incidents. Now, this is not something that we came up with ourselves. There are multiple frameworks uh, and security frameworks which go into a lot of depth and they kind of have a lot of overlapping areas. But the main six areas are from prevention, detection, analysis, containment, eradication and recovery. And it is an important part to look at because preparation is done, it's an ongoing item. These are life cycles, so they're constantly nearly all ongoing. But we're constantly preparing for the next cyber attack. We do that through policies, through procedures. Um, we do that through employee training. We do it through um, how we generate reports, how on a consistent basis we report 
uh, risks and cyber risks to subcommittees, to IT committees, to risk committees, to the board. Because all cyber risk and all information security risk as part of operational risk is reported or has to be reported to the highest levels of management. So they can take an informed decision for the next strategy, for the way how the organization can move forward. Identification, we've already mentioned this. Identification, this is the detection part, is the responsibility of everyone within an organization. Um, you may receive a phishing email. Somebody else may find um, a USB stick in the garage and decide to plug it into their computer, not knowing what it's got in it. Um, some other people at security or network side might be configuring network switches. We all have to, we all have our role to play here in the identification. Analysis, identifying the root cause. Here, there is no blame culture. Everyone at some point or other is going to fall victim to a cyber event, to a cyber attack, to information security incident. It's not about, it's not about assigning blame. It's about identifying how this actually happened, why it actually happened, and then putting in mitigants or containing the incident, obviously, but also the long-term goal here is to make sure that it doesn't happen again. This could be through reinforced learning. This could be through more in-depth configuration, vulnerabilities, patch management, whatever it may be, but it's about proper identification and then carrying out the forensic analysis. Here for forensic analysis is where we do need the expertise of IT. We do need the expertise of cybersecurity experts to actually go in depth into the zeros and one and identify everything. Containment. Containment is about limiting the impact of the incident. Recall the heat maps, which Elena showed us, we have the likelihood and impact. Well, the likelihood is with, an, with a really real incident, the likelihood is active, it's actually happened. The impact is about how the incident is actually going to affect the organization. We can contain the impact if we act fast. By re fast, I mean really fast. We need to take drastic, sometimes lightning fast measurements, uh, actions to actually contain the incident so that it stops progressing. So we can limit the impact in the future by taking action today. It's very important that this is done not only with for an organization, but also for society in general. Back at Bank of Letter, we realize we are not here as a bank working in isolation. We are working here with the community, community as part of the community. So we do realize that the effects that we have on the community are substantial. So we take quick measures to contain such incidents. Once again, eradication is something which is done at all levels or at different levels within our organization at management within IT, at from the, with the cyber experts, sometimes even from external third parties. Because we do have to realize that sometimes we do need to bring in external third parties, vendors, um, solution providers to actually help us with eradication of uh, management of the incident. And finally, the recovery phase. The recovery phase is not just another tick box exercise. The recovery phase is where we bring in all the information we've understood about the incident, how we've handled it, what mitigations we are going to put in place, what additional controls we're going to put in place, execute a detailed lessons learned exercise to understand how the organization can move forward. What are, which areas do we need to tweak to fine tune so that controls can be put in place so that incidents don't reoccur. Incidents are a fact of life. It's just like people getting uh, a common cold, uh, a sunburn. We need to apply sun cream so that we don't get sunburned. Doesn't mean we're not gonna get sunburned. It means that we are just applying what we believe are the necessary amount of controls to protect us from a sunburn or then to recover from it afterwards. It is the obligation of, from the board of directors all the way down to the lowest level of employees to deal with cyber awareness and to deal with incident handling. We have a final poll here today, which we'd like to uh, give to you at this point in time. And it's specifically regarding cyber risk awareness. I'll just launch it in a minute. 
what we would like to ask you right now are, are employees well aware of cyber risks and cyber threats? Now here, we understand that some of you might not actually be gainfully employed in that university, but think of yourself or as your future role within an organization or your current organization. Are you, are you or are your other employees aware of cyber risks and cyber threats? Are you knowledgeable about phishing, about malware, uh, what ransomware is, um, what risks of cyber in relation to uh, availability integrity and confidentiality of information assets. Do you know what these things are? Do you believe your colleagues do? I'll just let it run on for a couple more seconds and then we'll share the results. Right, so if I share the results with you and over here, we have a very close tie, I would say, between yes, employees are now uh, very familiar and some employees and more education is needed. I believe this, well, the good thing is that everyone has an opinion and that there's a not sure is basically empty. So basically somebody, everybody has an opinion on the matter. And also we do also have that major educational campaigns needed to enhance awareness is also very low percentage of 13%. But this close tie tells us that we're actually split between two frames of mind, where people believe, or people all understand the importance of cyber awareness, which is good. But people also want more cyber awareness. Some employees are aware more education is needed. This is more of a call for help. The, these, these kind of participants are actually telling us that there is much more need for cyber awareness within, your, within not only organizations, but within society, we need, and once again, cyber awareness is not just the responsibility of all organizations as a whole. I was talking a moment ago about BOV being part of the Maltese community and society. Well, it's not just Malta, it's the entire world population. We need to enforce and start reinforcing cyber awareness from, to our kids um, as, part of their, as part of their cyber culture, as part of their, um, how they use technology, how they interact with technology, how they understand technology. Technology is not something which is only used by people who work in banks or within the financial arena anymore, or by gaming. It's used by everybody. Everybody today has a smartphone. 20 years ago, hardly anybody had smartphones or the phones we had were considered smart, but we're not there. We weren't as, uh, they weren't full touch screen. The internet wasn't available to everybody instantaneously all the time. Technology is moving forward. Cyber awareness has to move forward with technology. It's good to see though, that most employees are now very familiar. So, that's good to see, and it shows that there is good amount of awareness actually happening within organizations as well. Now, in the last bit of this webinar, we'd like to uh, bring back a key element, which is a very large, big interest for us, and that's about recruitment. Thank you, Antoine. And let me say a couple of words, and then we will <clears throat> take a few questions. Uh, we are um, on the exciting journey of building risk management within BOV, and we are actively recruiting. So if you found what um, we talked about today interesting, if you are excited with this area, if you are as passionate as we are, please reach out and join us. So you can apply online or email our resourcing team. We've got exciting positions in all of the three areas of operational risk. We have within business partnering, we have opportunities, we have opportunities within cyber, as well as operational resilience and third party risk management. So it's such an exciting journey, I think. And again, for me, operational risk management is the best place to be to work and to build your career in. I think the polls today were quite telling. You know, all the three polls told us a story that uh, we are not there yet. We are on the journey. And we collectively, as risk practitioners, need to continue and to continue quite a lot. It's not that we were off the mark just by a little bit. I think we 
what comes across through today's event is we do need to continue quite actively working together and working with the business to build the risk culture and continue embedding good practices. I would also say a couple of words of on um, celebrating success. I think <clears throat> at times risk is seen as a gloomy critic using the threats, risks, incidents, risk events, sort of type of language and words with negative connotation. And I think for me, an exciting part of risk is also being able to celebrate success, which is identifying an incident, celebrating success because we are doing lessons learned and we will improve the process and learn the lessons. And next time we are going to come out of it better, better ourselves as we were previously and maybe better than other organizations. We will come out more resilient um, and better from the risk management perspective. <clears throat> so with this, let me ask a couple of questions that came for Antoine. So I think one question in particular is a confusion begin between what is IT security and IT risk. How do you see that this should be split? Um, if Antoine, you can voice your opinion. Right, um, very interesting question. IT security and IT risk. One cannot exist without the other. IT security is all about understanding the risks there are within IT. Um, I don't know the basis or background from the person of the person who actually asked the question, but I'll try and uh, simplify it as much as possible for the whole audience. You will not be able to understand IT security if you don't understand the risks involved. What do I mean by that? You need to understand IT security is there to protect your assets. These are normally information assets, but so let's say you're looking at um, the files on the hard disk. So you want to encrypt them, encrypt them. Now, you've got to understand that you've got to understand the risk of losing that data. What's the risk of losing that asset? So you would start off not by saying, let's just encrypt everything. No, you'd say, let's start by having a policy in place. The policy will tell us how to categorize certain bits of assets, certain data. So is the data restricted? So it's like top secret. Is it confidential for certain eyes only? Is it internal just for internal eyes or is it public? Public being that it can be distributed freely through anyone in and out of the organization without a problem of having a confidentiality leak. So you've got to understand the risk for the data before you can apply certain controls on the data. So Encryption is a type of control. Um, access management, so logical access controls, having a username and password to access that content, to access the data, that is another control. We then have to look at, is the data at rest or is the data in transit? Is it moving and who is accessing it and how is it protected while it's in transit? So these are all risks to the asset but you can't actually establish the IT security controls unless you understand or at least establish the risks to the asset in general. So, as I said, you cannot establish or implement IT security without understanding or having a good understanding of IT risk. Now, is it the first line? Is it the second line? Is it IT? Is it cyber? Is it networks? Well, it's everyone. This is where we were speaking about, about having a facilitated our CSA, where we were having an approach whereby risk is explained to all parties. And then depending on the bank's risk appetite, the bank's policies or the organizations, I'm sorry, I'm just saying the bank all the time, it's out of habit, but it's about understanding it and then applying the controls proportionate to the risk to have an, an acceptable level of security. It's all about accepting. What are we willing to accept here? So you will take certain some organizations which will have a very elevated security posture, like the um, cyber unit, like Ministry of Defense, like uh, like uh, the Army, and then we'll have financial institutions which are still quite elevated, and then you'll have your local uh, cheesecake store which uh, while security is important, they don't want their contact list of all their clients going out, but it's not of paramount importance. So understanding IT security, IT risk, it has to be proportionate to the organization, but one cannot exist without the other. 
Thank you very much, Antoine. I think it's it's a very good answer to this question. And what I would say is we will stop here. I know we are running out of time. We very much enjoyed speaking to you today. And we thank you very much for taking your time to join us on this webinar. We are hoping to do many more of these. Please, uh, if you are interested, um, contact us. We, we would be delighted to hear from you. And on this, we wish you a very nice day um, and uh, um, a good afternoon. Thank you very much.